I, I think the black pill that we took was people talk a lot about the blockchain trilemma, but I don't think that that's practically what most devs are optimizing for. I think they're optimizing for a much more practical trilemma of where they can get access to users, other developers for integrations, and liquidity or capital, right? As opposed to necessarily decentralization, scalability, security, which of course you want to be able to check either way. So I think the, the second realization that we had was that it's really important for applications to have a reason to exist on chain A versus chain B. Hey everyone, if you have been listening to Empire, you know that Santi and I are fed up with unaffordable fees and frustrating transaction speeds that make the on-chain experience basically unusable. So the Arbitrum team reached out and they showed us the platform. They showed us what you can do on Arbitrum. Whatever you're doing, you can experience frictionless transactions at lightning speed on Arbitrum. So head over to portal.arbitrum.io and check it out. What's up, everyone? Before we jump into today's episode, I'm excited to share Empire's first ever security partner. Harpy is the best tool to prevent your wallet from theft in real time. Harpy is not just a security solution. They are a peace of mind solution. But don't just take our word for it. Harpy is the only wallet security solution that protected 100% of its users from attacks like the Ledger one in Q4, which was an off-chain signature attack. To learn more about Harpy, click the link in the show notes or visit harpy.io forward slash empire. This episode is brought to you by Supra, an Oracle provider across more than 50 different blockchains. If you are building anything in crypto, you likely need verifiable randomness and you need oracles. Well, for Empire listeners, Supra is now offering a limited deal. It is 12 months of Supra free for any Empire listener. You can go to supra.com, that's S-U-P-R-A.com forward slash Blockworks, limited time only. Go check it out. Thanks, Supra, for sponsoring Empire. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Uh, today we have Smokey, the co founder of Barachain. I've had the privilege of uh, seeing Smokey in the Barra team build uh, as an early investor, and I'm very excited to bring him on. I think it's going to be a great discussion uh, talking about all things Barachain, everything that's happening under the hood. Uh, which is a lot. I don't think a lot of people are appreciating. So, uh, anyway, Smokey, thanks for coming on, and uh, it's great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Santi. Glad to be here. Um, should be a lot of fun. I've definitely uh, I've observed from the sidelines before, but cool to be uh, you know having a little fun in the spotlight as well. Yeah. So, for context, uh, Smokey pinged me. Uh, we were supposed to record this three days uh, ago, and he said, "Like I have COVID. I just came back from Denver. <laughs> I think he still has COVID." So, this is one of the hardest working. MFs out there. And this is testament. He still has COVID and he's here showing up. So uh, <laughs> thanks for uh, <laughs> doing that. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the the story of the conception of building uh, Bear Chain and kind of the, the zero to one moment. Yeah, for sure, man. And yeah, I'll apologize in advance for any coughing fits or, or slightly prepubescent sounding voice. I promise it's not always like this, but uh, conference flu got us good and well this year. Like there were like 10 plus bears in Denver. And um, we threw like an all-day event called Bear Palooza, and I think somewhere in the, you know, shaking thousands of hands or whatever, I, I got uh, I got wrecked. So it wouldn't be the first time. Get COVID. Who would have thought, right? Who would have thought? Yeah. Um, yeah, man. So to, to answer the actual question, um, I think we we very much subscribe by accident to the whole idea of like you know something interesting will start out looking like a toy. Um, for context, myself, my co-founder Papa have been in the crypto space since like 2015. Um, so, you know, started just buying ETH and Bitcoin, all the fun stuff when we were, you know, doing our services or spending our, our tour of duty in the Valley, if you will, and building our first companies. Um, and I think when you just see enough smart people moving in a given direction, you're like, okay, cool. Like, you know, I should probably not fade this. Like either everyone else is stupid or I'm stupid. And we definitely do have a habit of betting on our own stupidity, which um, Baritain has perhaps been a, an extended exercise in. Um, so, you know, over time, I think that uh, we saw a bunch of fun stuff come and go. We saw the shitcoin slash like the, you know, the ICOs of 2017, 2018. Um, we saw like DeFi summer actually kick off. We saw like some of the cool stuff in DeFi 1.0. Um, and I think it was in like summer of 21 when we saw Parallel start to take off um, at the same time as like a bunch of these DeFi communities were ripping, whether that's Ohm, Alchemix, Olympus, et cetera, or, uh, you know, Curve, Frax, et cetera. Um, and we're like, okay, cool. Like, you know, all this funky stuff is happening on chain. Um, and now for the first time, there's like, what looks like a pretty high quality game um, with like, you know, this whole like Magic the Gathering slash Hearthstone on chain vibe. Um, and there's all these like high quality NFTs that they're putting out. So Papa and I had been spending a bunch of time in like these DeFi discords um, at the same time as like, you know, paying attention to Parallel and like 
playing the first couple of pack drops and whatnot. And we're just like, oh, like maybe there's something fun that we can do more than anything for just shits and giggles. Like there was no grand end vision of a chain. There was just like, hey, what if we made some some NFTs for fun? You know, sold them to some of our friends, see if they're into it, and then kind of just like, you know, wing it from there. Um, and that was honestly the, the the genesis of all this, which is is very like fucked and hilarious in hindsight, honestly. And um, we, you know, Papa drew a hundred JPEGs of bear smoking weed, and we literally uploaded them in the, like like the most hood manner possible, like open sea store tokens, not even like you know proper ERCs, and raffled them off in a whole bunch of different DeFi discords. So a bunch of these went out to like the Ohm community. A bunch of these went out to like Frax, a bunch of these went out to like Curve and Alchemix and stuff. And they were like being sold at 0.069 ETH or something back in the days where, I guess back when ETH was 4K again-ish. So, you know, not enough to really put people out a bunch, but definitely not like your, your oh my God, this is such a an overpriced NFT mint kind of moment. Um, and we ended up with a, a very like interestingly distributed community. You had on one hand, these groups who were just like highly DeFi native, highly DeFi centric spent all their time thinking about the next on-chain game. And then you had these people who were like, oh, cool, funny JPEG of a bear. I'm going to buy it because I like NFTs. And um, I think somewhere in that mix, we ended up striking a really nice mix of like left curve and right curve um, and ended up with like a pretty cool, um, I'd say version of what we think about a lot is like, you know, just a barbell or, or a horseshoe theory kind of thing where you have like the far left and the far right intersecting. Uh, and we actually just ended up like talking with these guys over time. And as we, you know, did that, we also made a series of honoraries for like some of our friends on CT, so folks like Zeus and DCF God and so on and so forth. Um, and we were, you know, talking to some of those friends and we're like, you know, what if we found a way to take this a little bit beyond like your standard, you know, kind of like wacky NFT project and added a little bit of like game theory to it. So we decided to make the, the JPEGs of the Bears rebase and we're like, cool, we're going to, you know, have collections. We're not exactly going to have like 1600% APY and, and rebase three times a day. But we'll, we'll allow for a cool distribution mechanism that means that we can put out a new collection every couple of months and let that, you know, that, that supply decentralize over time while basically awarding initial holders. So people who hold, held one of the initial, initial bears ended up with like one of the second collection. People who held those two ended up with another two. So you could go from like one to two to four to eight to 16, you know, 32, et cetera, bears. Um, and I think that was the point at which we decided to do the thing that I, I think that I found less of my protocol founder friends doing and the thing that like, you know, YC, et cetera, just kind of beats into your head, which is to A, try to make something that people want uh, and B, to actually talk to your users and, you know, find a hundred people that love the idea of what you're doing um, and even better actually love an interactive product. And um, as we talked to more and more of these people within like this, this barbell group, as I mentioned, we had a bunch of folks who were fairly technical, who are running nodes, who had been, you know, involved in like, you know, uh, basically running nodes since like ETH chests, et cetera. Um, and we had them like fairly on chain nowadays. And um, the question that we found them asking quite a bunch was, uh, I guess like this this logical trade off or this fallacy of, of liquidity and security in their interaction on chain. In that, if they had a given pool of capital, they had to choose to either allocate that to staking with a validator, you know, in ETH, um, or to you know on chain liquidity and Uniswap, Aave, whatever it might be. And it was very like nonsensical that by contributing to the security of the network, they were inherently detracting from the liquidity or the on-chain activity, uh, and vice versa, right? Um, and I think we, we certainly believe that, like, LSTs are a meaningful step in the right direction there. Um, but this is also, like, you know, mid-late 21, early 22. Eigenlayer was barely a concept that people knew about. Um, and, and even still, you know, as we think about this in the context of today, I think Eigenlayer is super interesting, but isn't necessarily all-encompassing in terms of liquidity. Um, it's more about, you know, what can one do with ETH and all of its different forms. Um, and we basically thought to ourselves, would it be possible to build a network that actually allowed you to fundamentally align incentives between security and liquidity um, at the protocol level. And I think that this was sort of bolstered by another set of you know, realizations that we had while playing these different chain rotations and exploring all the different alt l ones, whether that's you know, Nier and, and Santiago, if I recall correctly, you're pretty involved in that ecosystem at one point, uh, or AVAX or Phantom or anything in between. Um, and just seeing more than anything else, like ecosystems with hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions, sitting relatively inactive in their validator sets, like contributing to network security while the chain itself was just dead, like absolute ghost town. Um, and or the applications living on top of it, if not entirely dead, were entirely devoid of any reason to exist on chain A versus chain B, right? Like I think the black pill that we took was 
people talk a lot about the blockchain trilemma, but I don't think that that's practically what most devs are optimizing for. I think they're optimizing for a much more practical trilemma of where they can get access to users, other developers for integrations, and liquidity or capital, right? As opposed to necessarily decentralization, scalability, security, which of course you want to be able to check either way. So I think the, the second realization that we had was that it's really important for applications to have a reason to exist on chain A versus chain B. Um, and I don't think that a reason that, that lasts, it's simply like, hey, we gave you a grant, now you can live for two months. Uh, I think that it actually has to be much more mechanistically enshrined uh, and much more, I'd say, uh, closely intertwined to the application itself. And that's sort of where that, that second extension of proof of liquidity came to mind, which is, okay, can we allow any form of liquidity, including that contributed to or that derived from other applications living on a network to actually become part of chain security? Um, and that's basically my, my long-winded answer for, you know, how we thought about bear chain. It's, you know, how do we actually turn liquidity into security? And how do we make that a productive, you know, source of capital or source of efficiency for the applications that are building on the chain itself? Yeah, definitely. So I think when I first heard the pitch, proof of liquidity really resonated with me as someone that is actively in thinking and using DeFi. And at the time, you know, as you said, Eigenlayer was not really in, in the in the picture. But, you know, in, in today's world, I want to double click on what you just said. Like, how do you see proof of liquidity relative to how Ethereum is kind of shaping up with, you know, obviously proof of stake uh, and, you know, a lot of these kind of derivative products to yeah. try to get at what you guys are probably doing more natively, which is just more capital efficiency and alignment between security sure. and liquidity. But I want to dive deeper into that. Yeah, yeah, no, it totally makes sense, man. And, and I think it's a good question. Um, because there's no, the devil's always in the details and so is the nuance, right? Um, and I guess rule number one of CT slash crypto in general is that people don't read. Um, so <laughs> the way that we think about it is that um, proof of liquidity in many ways is a variant of delegated proof of stake, but there's some pretty important differences. Um, one is that, you know, it actually relies on, you know, what we have in, in a sort of a dual token. And it's actually a tri-token system for us specifically because there's also a network stablecoin that's very low risk, et cetera. Um, but for us, proof of liquidity really comes down to the interactions between two tokens, BGT, or the Bera Governance Token, and Bera, um, which is the gas token slash liquid token for network. The first thing to keep in mind is that BGT is uh, a natively illiquid soul-bound token, um, which is to say that one cannot market buy it, one cannot just go purchase it on a DEX. They actually have to do the work or provide the value of providing liquidity to the ecosystem in order to earn BGT itself. Um, so that in itself is like the basis for, for proof of liquidity in that the staking token and the governance token of the network, BGT, can only be obtained via actually doing the work of providing liquidity. And I think that's part of like the, the social contract or the consensus that we want to enforce, which is to say in order to reap the, the, you know, the rewards of network governance or network staking, you have to have first provide the value that we think is most essential to the network, i.e. liquidity. Right? So... Um, to go more granularly, the way that this actually works on a network level is that BearChain has a set of, you know, 100 plus validators, um, and each of those validators have their own, um, you know, you can think of it as a gauge or a cutting board in the same way their fracks or curve gauges. And validators, when they win a block, are basically able to allocate their block rewards across the different pools on the network. So that starts with, you know, something as simple as the DEX, the perps vault, in the lending market that'll be live when the chain goes live. Um, and validators can basically choose to forward or redirect their block rewards towards those different points in the network in the form of that BGT. Um, and at the same time, users can choose to delegate their BGT that they've earned via providing liquidity in one of those venues to the validator, uh, to a given validator, depending on how it's distributing its BGT. So for example, you could have a user who has a large you know, position in the DEX and they could choose to you know, delegate the vast majority of the BGT that they earn towards a validator that's doing the same and that is effectively pushing the vast majority of their block awards towards the, the DEX pools that they're LPing in. Um, on the other hand, you could have a validator that's taking a much more, you know, index-like approach and is effectively, you know, pushing part of its block awards towards the per perps vault and towards pool A on the DEX and pool B on the lending market, et cetera. And a user who might have a more diversified portfolio might actually choose to work with that validator. Um, so, you know, the, the, whole, the whole idea of proof of liquidity is that in order to earn the staking token, 
um, of the network and the governance token of the network, you have to first do the work of providing liquidity. And by voting with or staking with the validators that are you know, effectively determining where emissions on the network go, you are able to, as a user, help control the flow of incentives and therefore ideally liquidity across the network. Um, and at any point in time, one can take that BGT um, and one way burn it into Bera, the gas token. So you can never just go buy a bunch of, BG, uh, of Bera and turn it into BGT, but you can take the BGT that you've earned via providing liquidity on the network and turn it into Bera. Um, so I think that's a, the, the most base implementation of it. There's definitely more nuance there in that, you know, protocols can work directly with validators to incentivize their own liquidity pools. Uh, and over time, you know, the part of proof liquidity that I think gets most exciting uh, and I think is, is a major deviation beyond what I've already, already described from proof of stake is that over time, any smart contract on bear chain can plug into proof of liquidity and it can actually become an eligible destination for BGT emissions and generation. So you could have a, you know, Delta neutral vault. You could have, a, have an NFT AMM like pseudo swap. You could have anything that people are effectively depositing liquidity into and in exchange for some portion of that application's value generation, whether that is fees, whether that is token emissions, et cetera, going towards the BGT stakers on the network, you can actually have the chain itself directing emissions and part of its block rewards, that BGT reward, uh, towards that new application. And I think that's what gets really cool because, you know, I don't think there's an example to date, to my knowledge at least, of a proof of stake chain that can actually, you know, power the applications building on top of it. Right, we've seen CSR type approaches that sort of you know give rebates of sorts to the largest gas consuming you know contracts on the network. But I don't think that's actually the chain's block rewards going towards the protocols that are being you know deemed as most important by its validators and users. And I think that's the the social contract that gets uh, very exciting over time, and hopefully gives more and more applications uh, a reason to actually build on Verichain uniquely because they can turbocharge their capital efficiency. They can effectively enshrine themselves into the chain uh, and they can find a way to work with the validators to gain a mechanistic advantage in a manner where I don't think they could anywhere else. Yeah. How is the allocation uh, decided in terms of the BGT rewards? Yeah. So it's, it's entirely done by the validator set. So, you know, any, uh, and I guess the way to think about it is that, you know, uh, validators will have different amounts of BGT staked uh, with the, or, you know, delegated to each of them. And each validator will also have its, uh, its, its own customized distribution of how they wish to, you know, divide that BGT across the network, right, in terms of where they will forward those emissions. So what actually determines the, you know, rewards rates across the network or across all the pools being powered by proof of liquidity is the weighted average of each of those validators, right? So, you know, one validator might have 100,000 BGT stakes them, another might have 10, right? Um, mm -hmm. So obviously one will have much more weight than the other. Um, but it's effectively the validator set and the user's distribution of their delegations um, that determines the network reward rates and the, the breakdown of the BGT. In that model, can you talk about who the validators are and could they have a misalignment of interest or incentives when it comes to allocating that BGT? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, the validators on the chain will, will have, a, I think, a few different profiles. Um, on one hand, there'll be a number of your, your, I'd say, your classic sort of most established validator groups. So think like your Figments and your Kilns and your Coinbase Clouds and all those types of groups um, who are just experienced node operators that can, can keep up with good network upgrades, all that kind of stuff. Um, on the other hand, I'm sure that we'll have a number of investors um, that'll be looking to run their own nodes and folks that have, you know, previously been private participants in bear chain rounds. Um, we also expect to see some of the largest LPs on the chain um, serving as validators at some point for those that are competent in running node operations um, because, you know, it actually very cleanly uh, sort of satisfies that social contract that we discussed, right? If someone is going to be, you know, dropping $25 million into a stable pool, um, they're contributing a lot of value to the network. That should allow them to, you know, gain a pretty meaningful initial BGT stack. And they, as a validator, could also choose to do as much as possible to direct more towards their pools. Um, we also do expect to see a few protocols running validators, um, which I think becomes really interesting uh, and opens up a little bit more of a, of a competitive dynamic. So, for example, some of the ones coming out of the, the chain incubator, the Build-A-Bear program, 
we expect to see some of those guys running validators and some of the larger names that are coming over from other chains, which we can't exactly uh, you know disclose as of yet. But it's definitely one way for that, those groups to have a little bit of like edge in the, in the market. Um, the thing that gets interesting is like, I think that the incentive marketplace that will be built on top of the validators should allow for, you know, the most efficient market to reign free um, in that at any point in time, you know, a new protocol will be able to effectively submit an offer or, you know, bribe, think like Vodium style in, in a manner to the validator set. Uh, and, you know, whichever validator chooses to to pick that up um, will A, be able to have a call option on that, that protocol in the form of its tokens, its fees, whatever it might be, um, while B, uh, effectively being able to actually help power that protocol uh, from an emissions and capital efficiency point of view. Um, a lot of this goes towards, I think, um, the endpoint that I mentioned of really just getting the best protocols to build on the chain uh, mm-hmm. and actually getting the validator set to work closely with those groups such that we actually, I think, strive towards a, as meritocratic of a system as possible, right? Um, yeah. If you're a validator and, you, and you're figuring out what you want to do with your block awards, um, you can either choose to double down on you know the, the most classic, perhaps high-yielding pools um, or high activity pools, or you could basically say, "Hey, there's this new protocol that I want to have exposure to, and I want my delegates to have exposure to. Why don't I work with them and direct some portion of my rewards there?" Um, and when we think about ways that this could be, you know, exploited or, or you know, effectively enforced in a manner that's that's negative, uh, a lot of it does and, and will come down to governance and social contract. Um, I do think that the nice part is, though, you know, the governance here is very much people who have had to put skin in the game. Um, and people who have had to, you know, do the work contributing to liquidity if they want, you know, say over how it actually flows. Um, so I'm sure that I'm sure that in practice we'll definitely have events where people try to do, you know, weird like mochi like stuff. But I also do um, have belief, and I think we think a lot about the initial validator set selection and or delegation, uh, and ensuring that they're sort of responsible actors, um, you know, with the network safety and long term health. Uh, at as their priorities, which is of course why I mentioned some of the private investors, some of the protocols, etc. Um, mm-hmm. You want folks who care a lot about and who are, have a vested interest in the network, you know, living for a very long time safely. Yeah, and what is what are these emission curve look like? Um, yeah, so we've um, we've been joking about the the bear chain happenings <laughs> um, in that you know the you know, I, well, I can't say exact APY wise. Um, we do expect to have you know meaningful inflation to start. Um, enough to really, you know, give proof of liquidity a good amount of juice uh, and allow those those block rewards to flow well. Um, and then to basically have a series of happenings, um, you know, first one after like a year and change, second one after another one, so on and so forth. Um, with the idea of basically, you know, driving in inflation to the you know, low single digits over time as sort of a maintenance rate. Yeah. Um, so I want to maybe focus a little bit on the journey to what you are now and the roadmap and how you, you know, see the next year unfolding for you guys. Um, yeah. But so timeline wise, just walk us through. So like the NFT conception, and then you start <laughs> building a bear. Um, how long did that take? You're building through the bear. No, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're building bear through the bear. <laughs> so how was that? Where are you now? And what are the thing like? What's in store for the next six twelve months? Yeah, for sure. Um, there's a, there's a lot coming and there's a lot in the past, I suppose. So, you know, we sort of did our, our and uh, I don't think that fundraising is a milestone, but I do think it's something that ends up as being a little bit of an anchor point. Um, so, I'll, you know, I'll discuss, you know, with context of that as well. So, you know, I'd say the, the idea fully found its its wings uh, probably in like early 2022. Um, the NFTs themselves were for the most part, like over the course of like mid 21 to like late 22 in terms of like those different collections coming out over time and the community growing and growing and, and sort of like, you know, effectively snowballing a little bit. Um, and then I think the, the whole idea of like bear chain uh, is something that we started like, you know, basically joking with people about uh, and, and throwing around a little bit more seriously um, in like that early 22 timeframe. Uh, and actually for the longest time, you know, the meme that we were just like doubling down on was we were just like, yeah, bear chain isn't real um, because we'd have a bunch of people you know, asking us if we were building a chain, we're like, no, there's there's no way the anonymous bears could build a chain. That's ridiculous. Um, and we just thought it was kind of funny. Um, it, it may have worked too well to an extent because we ended up with a whole bunch of folks actually thinking that bear chain wasn't real um, and being like, oh, I thought it was just like a crypto Twitter meme. Uh, so, you know, we're glad that we kind of proved that part wrong. Um, you know, we basically started building out the team on the engineering side in that like early 22 timeframe. 
um, Dev Bear, you know, who, who leads all technical operations internally, spent the vast majority of his career at Apple, previously, you know, studied one, uh, engineering at a top engineering school in Canada, um, and was, you know, building out the entire base play for this. Uh, and I think our first major public release of that was um, was Polaris, which is like sort of our, our open source uh, implementation of, of EVM on Cosmos. Um, it's currently under a BUSL license, but we plan to open source it over time. I uh, just wanted to make sure that we, you know, we're relatively protected until until the chain itself goes live so that we don't have to deal with even more berry chain copycats than we have at the moment. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, you know, we basically announced our, our Series A slash our larger fundraise in the um in in like i believe it was april of 23 we actually completed the majority of that while ftx was blowing up over the year before mm. um which was lots of fun uh, and i'm sure you remember that market fondly um and then you know i'd say our, yeah our public code debut was uh with polaris was sort of in like that march uh that like you know q123 time frame and then after that we really started more aggressively expanding the the bd and growth team um for the longest time it was sort of just myself and home from our team um, spending mm-hmm. time like talking to projects, cultivating the community a little bit, um, just trying to wear every hat possible. And we wanted to make sure that as we started thinking about international expansion, as we started thinking about sort of more formal, I'd say breakdown within the growth team, whether that be DevRel functions, marketing functions, you know, validator relation functions, everything in between, uh, that we we hit that stride at the right time. Um, and then, you know, we launched our testnet in January of this year. Um, it's been pretty exciting. We did like a couple of small private testnets with, you know, some 50, 75 projects that wanted to build with us prior to that in just like a very locked down, you know, password protected manner uh, towards, you know, sort of the end of last year. And then, um, you know, took the reins off a bit and, and decided to show the world what we've been cooking up earlier this year. Um, so, you know, it's it's been a, a wild journey and we've seen the team go from like, you know, three dudes like living together to like, you know, seven dudes in a house to now like close to 45 people. Um, wow with uh, the entire engineering team in Toronto uh, and the the growth and, and sort of like uh, BD team that I spend more time on um, pretty globally distributed. So there's folks in Korea, there's folks in, you know, mainland China, there's folks in India, there's folks in Dubai. Um, there's a decent contingent in like New York and New Jersey. Uh, and then of course there's a decent Toronto presence as well, um, which is where we're, we're sort of all headquartered. So we've just been <laughs> expanding all over the place um, and are looking towards our mainnet uh, within the next few months. Um, so within the next six to 12 months, we should see, you know, the token live. We should see Bear Chain alive and kicking. Um, we should probably see the next batch of projects out of the, the Build-A-Bear incubator as well, mm-hmm. um, which we've been seeing a ton of inbound for more recently. Um, and I hope to see just like a very buzzing, lively, real ecosystem. Um, I think that like, you know, what what's always been most exciting to me and where I spend um, as much time as possible is just thinking about the zero to one stuff that can exist on bear chain or that bear chain is uniquely sort of built to serve um, and can really just, you know, how, how we can help enable that next group of, of builders who could go anywhere, but, but see a real fit here, whether that be user base, whether that be culture, whether that be mechanism design. Um, and I'm excited to start seeing, you know, more and more of those groups sort of come out of stealth, announce their rounds, announce that they'll be launching first on bear chain, um, all that kind of stuff. Because, I think that's something we've we've talked about a whole bunch internally um, is like, you know, what our approach is to the whole like next million slash next billion users thing is. And I think, I think while it has been a lot of a, a, a bit of a meme to date, honestly, um, I do think that there's a number of paths forward there. I think that on one hand, you need these projects that are like GMX or like front tech, they're like arbit- that are like DFK that actually have a chance of being like a vacuum for new people net into an ecosystem. Um, and I think you also need a really healthy degree of like, you know, user app, uh, like chain abstraction, UX improvements, account abstraction type stuff that makes it friendly and usable for a new person. Um, and ultimately, if we model um, a chain as the sum of all the applications that are living on top of it, in the same way as, like, you know, I think you, you think about an operating system, whether that's like Android or iOS, you don't necessarily think to no end about the operating system. You think about, you know, how it improves your quality of life and the apps you can uniquely use on one of those operating systems. Um, we want to make sure that the apps that are building things that people actually want to use uh, are living on bear chain um, and that we are that home or that sandbox for people building cool, new, interesting things, um, both culturally and mechanistically. So I think that's like the the real end goal for the next six to 12 months. How do we have all the new heavy hitters um, building cool new stuff on Vera? And what's the pitch to, so you mentioned there's a lot of like first time builders on Vera. But yeah. the pitch to protocols that are in another ecosystem 
What is the pitch to them? Yeah, for sure. I think there's um there's a mixture there, right? On one hand, there's this idea of like, okay, you know, if you guys want to, you know, turbocharge your capital efficiency, if you want to access a bunch of DeFi users who are actually pretty engaged and, and have actively tried new products, well, that's maxing out sort of the, you know, every new options platform or every new NFT fi platform, um, or just generally have meaningful on-chain net worths from every piece of data that, that one can find, um, you know, there's a, a there's actually like a captive audience. There's users, there's, liqu- there's liquidity. And then on the other hand, um, it's actually showing them um, not even just the, the first-time application builders, but the experienced application builders that will be launching new applications for the first time on Verichain and how they could plug into some of those ones. And effectively, the synergies are like the, the kingmaker trades that could uniquely exist for some of the apps that are building on Vera um, with bringing other people over. So, you know, for example, like there's the guys at Smiley Finance who I'm, who I'm fans of. They are, you know, part of the, the Italian options mafia that builds really cool products, but a lot of people, you know, it goes over their heads or it's just under the hood. And, you know, a lot of proof of liquidity will revolve around the decks or revolve around products that will have some degree of intermittent loss. Um, you know, for uh, for basically, you know, the people who are involved there, right? Um, and, or sorry, I'm permanently lost my dad. Uh, for people who are involved there. Um, and these guys build actually like really cool like yield hedging products that can allow people to actually hedge their IL, which could like pair super nicely with even the native decks uh, or a number of the other applications building on top of the chain, right? So I think that being able to show people um, that there are some very unique and interesting, you know, some of the parts is greater than the whole opportunities here. Um, has been a great pitch to builders Um, and also like a vibrant and real ecosystem. Um, I think that's, that's become like a bit of like a a meme as well over time as people are just like, Oh yes. Like look at my ecosystem. Look at my like, you know, 10 Villadrome forks and like three uni forks and like two Ave forks. Um, And I think that the nice part has been that when builders look under the hood here, um, they see a, like, you know, there's a vast majority of of quality of life services um, that they've been used to on other chains whether that's just ease of deployment of code and EVM equivalents, um, or on the other hand, you know, account abstraction, on ramps, you know, different wallet accesses, uh, sort of like everything in between there. Um, and they have just access to an ecosystem that has like people building new stuff that they haven't seen before. And I think builders really do appreciate that mm-hmm. um, because I think they're also a little bit tired of like the the grant and like, you know, chain of the day rotation meta. Yeah, yeah. So much of the pitch that I hear from teams is look, we want to plug into Ethereum because that's where the users and the liquidity exists. From your standpoint, how important is that? Or, yeah, how important is that for you? No, totally. I think that, and, you know, it's an interesting interesting question because it it makes me think of another one that we've discussed a lot. Um, I personally do not necessarily ascribe to the belief uh, around an Ethereum killer at the moment. I think there's a world where, like, I think there's a world down the road where you have, um, you know, Ethereum killers that perhaps with a massive amount of, of social tide changing um, and buy in from major, major institutions, your, your Googles, your Apples, whatever it is, that actually have the firepower and the distribution to achieve that uh, could, could will into existence. Um, but I actually think that, you know, the majority of chains right now are our best positions as, as Ethereum adjacent, right? And having access to a lot of ETH like resources, but not necessarily deviating from the ecosystem itself. Um, and I think I, I view us very similarly. Like I'd love to see us right up there beside Eve in terms of, you know, a chain that has a similar set of resources, um, perhaps one day a greater and or a similar amount of capital uh, and a great, you know, dev community and user community. Um, but I think that it's foolish to assume that that's, you know, feasible out the gates. Um, what I do think is entirely possible um, is to build an ecosystem that allows you to have the access of, you know, the capital, the users, the liquidity from ETH, and that's easily enabled by different bridging solutions, by different sort of like middleware solutions. So for example, for us, you know, we'll have layer zero there day one. We expect to have outposts for liquidity acquisition on a number of different chains for a number of the applications that will be living natively on bear chain, such that we can actually, you know, be a little bit more like as much of a meme as it is like ETH aligned or like ETH adjacent, right? Um, and do our best to to have access to those resources without necessarily living solely on Ethereum. Yeah. So I think we, we think about it like a lot more in terms of ETH proximity as opposed to necessarily one-to-one on ETH. A lot of the challenges historically has been that liquidity is very fickle and is a hot ball of money that is constantly trying to optimize. Um, 
is it, it, how do you think about that and you know in proof of liquidity because the incentives are kind of perhaps more aligned and enshrined does that create more stickiness to liquidity or do you foresee a, you know the same dynamic where people are just trying to optimize um and chase kind of better yielding opportunities yeah, I think it determines it, it's determined a lot by the profile of user that we end up attracting at the end of the day. Um, I think that in all cases, liquidity is always mercenary. And I think it's rational for liquidity to be mercenary, right? Um, I think most people are not necessarily on chain to change the world. I think they're on chain to make a buck, which you know I can respect. Um, and I think that when we model that, the way that we thought a lot about bear chain is how do you give people the greatest amount of utility and the greatest amount of flexibility with their liquidity, right? Like how do you have your stake in ETA2 without okay. creating, you know, threatening situations from a safety or leverage point of view, right? Um, you know, so for example, we often end up with a question of like, you know, what happens if if liquidity is pulled from bear chain, right? In like relative mass, right? Does that cause a death spiral? Does bear chain blow up? And it's actually, you know, I understand why people would ask that because it is of course proof of liquidity, um, but that is just, you know, a name for it. At the end of the day, you know, the chain doesn't blow up if people, you know, lose emissions or sorry, if people take out their liquidity. Um, rather, it just means that emissions are more concentrated to the group of people right. that remains, right? Um, There's so, a presumably market equilibrium where that increases the APY, attracts new users. Exactly, exactly. And there's other, there's other nuance there around how, you know, BGT itself accrues fees from the network's operation. So at some point, it's actually sort of more EV positive, for, theoretically, for a user to hold that BGT that's accruing yield over time um, than to just, you know, sell into bearer, rec- rec- withdraw their liquidity, et cetera. But that, that's a whole different rabbit hole. Um, I think that for us, the whole the thing that's, that's very interesting is that I believe that we give users more flexibility in terms of what they can actually do with their staked or LP'd capital um, than any, anywhere else, right? So, you know, they don't have to change their user behavior in LPing. Um, in these different applications, especially as more and more end up being powered by proof of liquidity over time, they rather just end up having their emissions boosted, you know, by the chain's emissions itself, uh, and actually then get to choose what to do with their BGT. And then they can choose to either use that to, you know, basically uh, delegate to validators that are being incentivized by their applications and use that to gain call options on, you know, cool, interesting new dApps, or they can just use that to, you know, boost their own yields or they can use that to just earn fees, right? I think what, what I'm getting at is um, proof of liquidity is meant to make liquidity as sticky as possible by boosting the yields in some manner, but on the other hand, um, by actually just giving users more optionality in terms right. of what they can do without sacrificing their initial desired position um, yeah. and changing their market behavior. Yeah, I guess to compare it, Blast seems like closest to uh, proof of liquidity with the nuance I'll add, and you correct me, that yeah, yeah. for instance, now people deposit in Blast are earning Blast points. Now that apps have launched, there are multipliers. If you're using the apps, you earn uh, app points. You also get <clears throat> Blast points if you're using and encourages usage of these apps. Mm-hmm. But I guess it's not... Um, at the mechanism level, that is more, I mean, I, I guess the question really is, how do you think about Blast in the context of proof of liquidity? Yeah, I think that both groups have um, a focus on on capital efficiency in some manner, in terms of like, you know, the underlying rebasing on Blast, um, and in terms of the point slash multiplier systems. Um, I think that what's different here. Uh, and, and the way that we think a lot about proof of liquidity is how those value flows are aligned, right? Um, you know, there's no single centralized actor. There's no group that's right. saying, hey, this app gets more, you know, emissions than that app. Um, there's only effectively what the validators and what the users on the chain who have contributed liquidity get to say. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that the, I think that the whole idea of an application being able to, you know, launch on Parachain and then actually plug into POL uh, and have the network dictate its outcomes to some extent, um, you know, is is pretty different from what we see there. In that, you effectively have the users um, in control of of where the applications end up incentive wise, and yeah. I think that that's like 
really important to actually focus on users and how to make their experience as good as possible. Um, but I do think that both groups have a focus on, you know, increasing capital efficiency in some manner. Yeah. In the, so the validators and in a scenario where there's one validator, I don't know if this is possible, but one validator yeah. has a disproportionate <clears throat> share of the governance power. Yep. How do you, are you a concerned about that being a kind of an attack vector or a, or are there mechanisms in place to, you know, make governance less of a kind of surface area, if you will, from a, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a great question, and and that is perhaps like the the biggest potential threat to to Bear Chain as a whole, um, and that's actually part of why you know one of the first projects that came out of Build a Bear, um, is called Infrared, and it's effectively you know a combination of a few different things, but on one hand an LST, um, on the other hand a governance aggregator. And on sort of the final hand, like a block building layer over time um, in sort of an MEV uh, operation context, such that, you know, proof of liquidity has pretty interesting incentives in place from uh, a block ordering point of view, because these validators are each incentivizing different pools, some of which they might be depositing into as well, right? Um, and you actually want to ensure that that's done in a, a relatively, you know, neutral and censorship resistant way over time, but also that as a validator, you're building the most effective blocks possible. Right, and, and ordering transactions in a manner that is, you know, not threatening to the network, but also good for you financially if you're running an MEV operation, right? right. Um, so part of what we wanted to do by working with the infrared guys who are, you know, good friends of the team uh, is, is ensuring that if there was to ever be an actor um, that had a, me you know, meaningful amount of, of network control, um, that they were very much, you know, I think on-side incentivized, um, you know, non-malicious actors, Right. Um, and that's why, you know, their system involves basically people being able to deposit into the various, you know, POL venues through infrared and receiving IBGT, um, a liquid staking token derivative of BGT over time, um, that they can then choose to, you know, use in their on-chain interactions as they should wish. Um, so, so in short, it, you know, there, I wouldn't say that there's a, a hard-coded technical condition. Um, and, you know, sadly, actually, the, ma the vast majority of Cosmos chains at the moment can be taken over. By yeah. like their top three to five validators, right? Um, and you know, always like to emphasize like, BG, uh, like bear chain is very EVM on the top, um, but at the validator logic level, it's it's tendermint consensus. It's it's there's mm -hmm. Cosmos under the hood, um, even though the vast majority of users wouldn't be able to tell that. Um, but the second thing is that like from a network incentives point of view, I'd say that you know bear chain is very much set up to um, really in you know I'd say to incentivize stake decentralization. Right, because you have each of these validators with their different incentives. And in many cases, you'll have some of these protocols running their own validators as well. And I think that what that actually does is it creates a number of different incentive schemes or, you know, game theory paths, if you will, for users to subscribe to um, when they're choosing what to actually do with their tokens. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's very unlikely that we find a situation where between the incentives markets and the inherent incentives of different validators um, that we actually end up in a scenario where we just have one behemoth like figure in the network yeah no i agree and the reason i ask is because historically you, you there is this tendency to, for validators to kind of cluster of course increasingly lido and then you look at you know in cosmos you look at all some of the app chains there's like exactly concentration is high and, and tends to be higher over time you've got but, it you've um, got it yeah. and, and and our goal is very much like i i think we as a chain like ethos wise we care a lot about maintaining competition um, I think that if you have a non-competitive ecosystem, it blows up over time. Um, and I think that, that we, we, we believe that that should ascribe to the validator marketplace as well, right? And that's why, you know, having these different protocols figure out their effectively like, you know, their, their bribe marketplace or matchmaking system um, allows for these different validators to have a leg up in terms of how they want to acquire users, delegates, stake, et cetera. All right, I mentioned them in the pre-roll. Now I'm going to bring them up again. It's Arbitrum. Santi and I are really fed up with these high fees and we're really excited to have teamed up with Arbitrum for the next couple of months on Empire. As the leading Ethereum scaling solution, Arbitrum now powers hundreds of decentralized apps across DeFi, perps, NFTs, gaming, and a whole lot more. The team has showed us everything in the ecosystem, both now and what's to come, and we're really, really excited about it. Arbitrum allows both daily users and developers to interact with Ethereum at scale with low fees and faster transactions. The way the team got me excited was through portal.arbitrum.io. So my call to action to you is to get started by visiting portal.arbitrum.io. Go experience on-chain like it was meant to be.
For a lot of Empire listeners, your crypto is not just another number on a screen. It's part of your future. I know Santi and myself feel that way. Our security sponsor of this episode, Harpy, takes this responsibility seriously and is the only wallet security tool that shields users from both on-chain threats and sneaky off-chain signature attacks. If you've ever been in that situation where you're moving quickly, you approve something on-chain, you realize that the address might be a dubious address or you're really hoping that you can take that back, Harpy has you covered. Harpy can redirect your assets to your self-custodied vault, ensuring they remain completely under your control, safe and sound. With Harpy's always-on monitoring, you're not just detecting threats, you're actively blocking and recovering compromised assets from malicious transactions before they can even confirm on-chain. Harpy is the only wallet security solution that protected 100% of its users from attacks like the Ledger one in Q4, which was an off-chain signature attack. So if you're serious about protecting Protecting your crypto investments, it's time to make the switch. Secure your wallet for free at harpy.io forward slash empire. That's harpy, H A R P I E dot I O forward slash empire. If you want it to be even easier, just click the link in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by Supra, an Oracle provider across over 50 different blockchains. Whether it's critical price levels or liquidation triggers, beat your competition to the punch with Supra. It's as good as having the first mover advantage on every price update. Supra offers fast oracles and DVRF free for 12 months at supra.com forward slash blockworks for a limited time only. So you're gonna wanna bank on this 12 month free offer as soon as possible. And if you're just listening and you know any builders, you can earn $1,500. That's $1,500 that you can go throw into Bonk or Whiff or whatever meme coin you like by letting them know about this deal. They can get fast oracles today free for 12 months and you get $1,500 for the referral. You can visit supra.com forward slash blockworks to learn more. Go check them out. Tell them Santi sent you. Tell them Jason sent you. We got you back. Thanks, Supra, for sponsoring. We've talked a lot about proof of liquidity, the mechanism. Uh, We've talked a little bit about the type of applications. Um, I guess anything else that you'd like to focus on on those things before we kind of transition more to uh, the roadmap and uh, kind of the things you're mostly excited about? Yeah, I think the <clears throat> the only thing I'd add is like one thing that we think about a lot and I think that informs like our, our, our building ethos, if you will, is the idea of like where value flows from and where it should flow to. Um, and I think that's probably like the the biggest thing that led us to a lot of the the changes or conclusions that we made um, to proof of liquidity over time. And that, you know, I think in a traditional proof of stake chain, you tend to see a lot of value accrue at the validator level, right? And that's great. Validators are super important in keeping the network alive um, and, you know, make sure that things are safe and that the chain does not go down or halt. Um, sometimes there's a bullish halt, but most cases less so, right? I, I think that. Um, in proof of liquidity, the whole idea is that we're in service of the protocols and the users themselves. Uh, and that's probably the part that I would really try to, to nail home. Um, because while we do love our validators and we do think that they have actually unprecedented economic control and ability to, to gain economic upside in bear chain, um, what we do care about a ton is the users that are actually on the chain itself and the protocols that are actually bringing in new users. Like we model a chain like ours very much as like a B to B to B to a B to B to C function, right? In that, you know, I don't think that people will want to use bear chain just because mm-hmm. it's bear chain. Like, I think that's cool. And I'd love it if, if yeah, just, you know, no. the vibes, the culture, the community did it, but people want to use it because of what is on bear chain. Right. Um, and I think that by empowering the protocols to an extent that we haven't seen before, uh, and in turn, letting the users decide which protocols really are empowered and which ones win. Um, I think we create the first system that, as I see it, um, has value flows appropriately aligned, right? It's not yeah. just going to the miners. It's not just going to the validators. It's going to them in whatever way they want, especially with tons of upside to them if they yeah. work with the best protocols that are bringing new users into the chain. And I think that that's just like the, the most exciting like philosophy that I've seen around the building side. Yeah. Historically, that's been probably the biggest point of tension in Ethereum, right? You see time and time again from DYDX to so many people within the Ethereum camp that end up going to, as you say, you know, start their own ETH killers. And it really boils down to this concentration of rewards to a particular group. Whereas this presumably locks in and everyone shares in a more equitable manner, creates more consumer preference, creates more uh, 
a line flow, as you say. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to observe for sure. Um, I guess sometimes, like, when you... I want to talk about scalability fees and how that might compare to Solana, to an ETH L2, um, and particularly on the user side, you know. Do you have a view yeah, on, yeah. on the, where you guys kind of place on that map? For sure, for sure. Um, and, you know, that's one of the things that we think about the most, especially because, like, you know, one of the biggest issues that we had with our testnet was we were, you know, thrilled to see the, the amount of user inflow, um, but we did not expect, like, a million users. Uh, you know, I, I I'll say the word users with, with air quotes here, right? Like, it's definitely 50-plus percent bots from the data that we've seen. Right. Um, we'll take it over, like, the standard of, like, 80-plus percent bots, but, you know, still, uh, we, we didn't expect the degree of traffic that we saw. Um, and that actually caused us to run into some fundamental scaling issues that haven't actually been seen since like Terra blew up in a Cosmos chain, um, which is like, you know, a, a champagne problem in some ways, a problem problem in other ways, right? Um, so we've actually been spending a little while working on upgrades to the chain itself and its architecture um, that moves closer to, um, you know, a beacon chain like structure that actually, you know, resembles a lot more like ETH mainnet, which we just thought is really funny at the end of the day. Um, but something that allows us to maintain um, a ton of users without having as much of a dependency on the Cosmos mempool uh, or the Comet mempool, I should say, which has been a subject of great contention uh, or debate and every now and then a major blocker for folks, including ourselves. Um, so by moving you know, the execution into the, into the EVM uh, and making our lives a little bit easier there, um, we should, A, unlock a fair bit more performance in terms of you know concurrent users and, and traffic on one hand. Um, and on the other hand, uh, we actually end up with a chain structure that you know, is even more interoperable or even easier for users to build around um, than the current version of Polaris. So Polaris has already, you know, been demonstrated to be pretty compatible across the stack for different rollups. So if someone wants to deploy an OP stack rollup to, Solar uh, to Polaris, we've done this in the past with, uh, with the guys at Celestia. Uh, and just for explicit context, Polaris is effectively like our version of EVM on Cosmos. It's the base place that Barachain is built upon. So if you think about it as a stack, you know, you have the Cosmos logic underneath, you have like the Polaris EVM, um, and then you basically have like the POL logic, you know, basically wrapped on top of that or into the validator set uh, for Barachain itself to work. Um, and what we basically found over time is that we can build a solution that should have, you know, fairly low fees. I think there's a, there's a good amount of control over that. Um, I don't think that we'll shoot for quite as low fee-wise as Solana, but I think that's somewhere in like the, you know, the AVAX and or Polygon proof of stake type of like, you know, fee, fee layer is probably where we, where we end up by. Um, while at the same time, you know, maintaining our block times as, as, as low as possible, looking sort of the one to two second range, uh, and ideally driving those down more and more over time, while being able to support lots of different rollups for application-specific use cases. Mm -hmm. So we're starting to see the first couple of rollups pop up already on Vera. Um, there's Shogun, which would be like super cool, yeah. um, in 10th century, you good. know. Yeah, like, and I just, A, I love the product, and B, I think it's very interesting from a Vera point of view. And that the whole idea is, you know, trade any asset from any chain um, in like a coincidence of wants plus, you know, JIT uh, just in time LP vaults in parallel um, while settling it on bear chain. So, you know, you just have like your 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 mothership for trading of sorts um, while ideally passing through a network that should have some of the deepest liquidity flows on chain. And then we already have other groups who are looking to build, you know, structured product chains, um, gaming chains, a couple of consumer ideas, um, everything in between. So this I think is using, when you say that it's using Polaris. Yeah, you've got, so they would either, some of them will want to use Polaris itself as a rollup to Verichain. Um, mm -hmm. Other groups want to use like OP stack. I think those have been the, the two most like popular options to date um, in terms of actually, you know, building a rollup to Verichain. And when someone builds a rollup on Vera, how does that fee sharing or like uh, governance sharing happen? Is it basically the same? If they're yeah, plugging they, in, the rewards can be routed to them? And that's exactly what we're sort of like, you know, architecting right now. But um, ideally, yes. And what we think is like extremely interesting is sort of like, you know, apps, you know, basically app chain specific rollups, right? Um, rolling up to bear chain and being eligible for BGT distributions uh, and or, you know, BGT incorporation via POL um, in the same way that any application living on bear chain might be, right? Because, you know, they can have their super clean mempool, they can capture their own MEV from the application and the users on the chain, um, and they can perhaps, you know, plug into POL in exchange for some portion of trading fees or sequencer fees or whatever it is that might make most sense. Yeah. yeah so okay. I think that's like one of the very, you know, I, I think the, 
the beauty of POL is like the degree of customizability that we can get mm-hmm. in that, you know, an application really has to exchange value for liquidity, but that value can take so many different forms. It right. could be commissions from an NFT marketplace. It could be, you know, fees from a social fi app. Like I think that that can be, you know, super malleable. Um, and it actually just, you know, <laughs> Casey in Denver, I had to, I had to give a chat at both modular day and liquidity day at the same yeah, time. Yeah. So I decided to write a deck about modular liquidity. Um, modular, I, I, was, know, I was literally <laughs> just thinking that. Just like, reminds me so much of modularity, but like modular liquidity, I like it. <laughs> exactly, right? And I'm like, listen, this is kind of a meme, but there's actually an element of truth here in that proof of liquidity itself makes, you know, block rewards and incentives, you know, incredibly modular from a liquidity standpoint in terms of where it goes across mm-hmm. the chain, where they can be distributed, what they're distributed in exchange for, everything in between, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, Jack for what England's it's yeah. vibe there. <laughs> yeah. For what it's worth, I like the customization term better. Exactly. It's just yeah. more precise, I think. And you know, looking ahead, you know, in a world where we have these roll-ups using Polaris, we have native apps like also plugging into proof of liquidity. Is it fair to assume that in the early days, most of the reward will be derived from the high emissions from BGT? Over time, success probably looks like that shifts from governance rewards to fees from apps in a in a world where you have a ton of a thriving app ecosystem across different applications. Um, the validators are probably earning, I don't know, maybe 80-20 starts with BGT and then that shifts pretty on the app side more. Exactly. Exactly. And that, right. that's pretty powerful too. Because that, then- exactly. Right. Like what, what we think about is like, what is something that can actually be sustainable for a meaningful time frame, um, And also like culturally enforces the right ideals. Right. Um, and I think that that's like a point that sometimes goes underrated, like a, the, a, a chain's culture, or like what they, what they embody, like from an ecosystem, a building, whatever point of view um, is often like tough to exactly put a nose on. Right. You think of, of BSC as like a wild casino. You think of like, you know, Optimism as a lot of like pretty like OG ETH aligned folks. You think of Arbitrum as like a home for pretty cool DeFi stuff, right? And like base is starting to get in the mix there as well. Um, I think that what we want to enforce both like mechanistically and culturally is this idea that like, if people build cool stuff here, they will win, right? And I, and I very much think that that's, you know, uh, that's embedded within the validator logic and the incentive systems within the chain. On the MEV side of things and the validation side of things, like if a validator um, has a pretty big stake, say that a validator like Figment, right? They have a fund that is also investing in projects. So they've been say that Figment the Capital invests in a bunch of projects like Shogun or whatever, and then is there like a potential like? conflict of interest where like a validator um has a disproportionate say on like block ordering or mev if they like want to really just prioritize one app versus another and then that is in conflict with another validator group like does that problem make sense like i I, I get what you mean to an extent i think that like again like you know basically a validator will, will win will win more blocks if it has more bgt with it right um, and presumably the validators that have the most BGT will be the ones that, you know, are directing emissions towards the pools that are most used across the network, right? So I do think that the free market to some extent helps wow. resolve that problem um, in terms of, you know, the incentives will flow towards the pools that are most productive. But I also do think it's enti- it's entirely possible and likely that, you know, some of these, you know, groups, and to be clear, there won't be many, like we're thinking like single digits in each of them. Um, will be able to effectively, you know, prioritize their own applications and, and their own, you know, vested interests, right? In the same way that any LP who, yes. any validator who is also like a liquid fund may likely have like a meaningful amount of capital on chain and be like, cool, you know, I'm going to, you know, prioritize my transaction execution first. Yeah. Right? So I think that that, I think, I think both are feasible, but I also think that with the right checks and balances, um, neither end up being, you know, spirally problems. Yeah. It's, uh, I like the, the sort of the market takes care of it of these exactly things. exactly and like, look, you have I think more that, like customization exactly and and i think that like 
sometimes just talk, I, I think sometimes like the space airs in one of two directions to a fault. It's either super laissez-faire, like, trust me, bro, decentralized governance will figure everything out. And then you end up with Cosmos, right? On the other hand, sometimes <laughs> it's way too much like, no, we need to be, you know, everything hands-on, like there's no, there's no room for flexibility whatsoever. And then I think you end up with a centralized system. Uh, and I don't think either of those outcomes are ideal. I think what we're trying to go for is like, you know, a happy medium where there is some social covenant, there's some expectation of how people are to behave. Um, but it's not to the point where it's like, okay, cool. You do something bad and you get booted. Right. I think that's what slashing and, and, and everything in between is meant for. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, what, um, what are the things that are you, you're going to be paying most attention to now that you're kind of closer to mainnet? Um, you know, oftentimes I think about the evolution of a network like ethereum and then also solana now to some extent where a lot of times like you set certain parameters fees in particular is what i'm thinking about that you just it's hard to model out and predict and over time they've had to revisit like ethereum went through a number of iterations and most importantly eip 1559 um solana is probably going to have to do something similar is there something in your mind that it's kind of like a known unknown that you're going to have to just over time figure out through governance? Um, another perhaps way of asking the question is like, what are the biggest risks that you see? Yeah, yeah. But I like better kind of known unknowns because risks for sure, sometimes. For sure. yeah. I, I think that like, you know, the, so, so, so to start like from a, a scaling slash like fee point of view, um, I think there's a couple things that, that keep me up at night. Um, one is, you know, what happens if the validator set grows to some extent beyond part of our control? Um, as in if enough folks just via providing a ton of liquidity, whatever it is, um, end up with a large enough delegation or effectively a large enough BGT stack, um, that the active set ends up expanding to the point where, you know, um, block times are no longer palatable, right? And you just end up with like fucking 10 second blocks or something, right? And then you, you feel like you're on ETH mainnet. Um, I think a lot of people like... Yeah, I think a lot of people don't necessarily care about the um, about the actual block time. It, like, there's actually just a whole bunch more nuance in terms of like gas per second and like what the 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 feel is is what I think people care about. They want to feel like like you know they hit a transaction, and even if it's like a, a soft confirmation soul style, right? That that it went through, where they're like they're probably good, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what the vast majority of users think about. I think, you know, when you think about quant trading groups and, you know, large liquid funds, and everything in between, you know, that's, there's, there's more nuance there for sure. Um, but I think that that's one of the things that we, we give some time of day to, um, not something that we worry about a ton. Um, the fee side, as mentioned, you know, we will have like an EIP five, um, an EIP five, 1559 type system, like implemented as well. So like gas will be burned when it's used on Virgin. Um, so, you know, that should make our lives a little bit easier there, but I'd say that, since we aren't thinking ourselves, thinking of ourselves either as like a, you know, uh, the the lowest fee chain, right? I don't think that that's necessarily our, our core focus, but also one that is relatively malleable over time from a governance point of view. Um, one thing that I do think is kind of cool, and an idea that we've been toying with, but it's probably just a little bit early for implementation for us, is what some of these localized fee markets could look like, um, because I do think that there's promise there, and I think that like um, the idea itself like um, makes sense. Uh, from an implementation point of view, um, that's just probably likely more one of where, you know, devil's in the details, right? Um, and then I think beyond that, the, the biggest practical thing that keeps me up at night is, you know, what happens if we just do not amass a ton of liquidity? And what happens if proof of liquidity does not lead to people being as sticky as we'd like them to be, right? I think it's super easy to, to model the world all like wag me and like, like, trust me, I'll, I'll turn on the gates and then, you know, the billions will flood in. Um, but I also think it's very important to to be pragmatic or, um, you know, internally a little bit of a fudder as well in order to ensure max performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we think a lot about it in, in a very, you know, non-laissez-faire manner. Um, we think about it in terms of, you know, how do we talk to people who actually want to use the chain? How do we talk to groups that want to deploy, you know, idle liquidity? How do we talk to different groups that actually want to move their TVL over from other chains, whether that, whether that be their treasury, their vaults, whatever it might be, Right. Um, and, and, you know, do everything we can to stack the pads to have a strong advantage rolling into launch such that, you know, we have the stage set correctly for success in the long run. 
So BGT is generating lots of fees. Validators are starting to work with protocols. New ones are being launched and working with other groups on the chain, everything in between. Um, so I think that's actually the part that like, you know, that that's the biggest thing that keeps me up at night in, in, in other words. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you been opinionated in the type of applications in so bear you mentioned bear um, <laughs> yeah i yeah. wouldn't say that um i wouldn't say we've been opinionated in, it in as much as i think the applications building on the chain um represent some of the team members different interests and and sort of like what we feel like we can like add outsized value in right mm-hmm. um and also what the chain is most optimized to support so for example i don't necessarily think that um, from a liquidity or like capital efficiency point of view, that's always a top priority for games. But at the same time, I do think that they care a lot about like a cash incentive, like a, like a cost insensitive uh, and, and like active and engaged user base, right? So Papa from our team takes points on a lot for gaming initiatives and whether there are projects that are building, you know, uh, building games on chain or infrastructure and bringing, you know, five figures or eight figures of users, um, they have one reason to, to care about what we're doing, right? Um, on the other hand, you know, myself, Sammy, you know, Yogi, who was part of, you know, some of the first DeFi protocols to ever exist. Um, you know, uh, we we definitely err more towards DeFi. And are like, cool, like a lot of these applications will fit really well into proof of liquidity. Um, then there's actually our roots as an NFT project, right? So we have both a bunch of folks who want to be like, hey, how do I go and build like NFT perps? How do I build a cool new marketplace with liquid backings? You know, how do I build like the next gen of like NFT production and or financialization permits? Um so I guess to answer the question most succinctly, we definitely have a leaning in that I think that we are T-shaped with a, with a focus on DeFi, um, yeah. just given the structure of the chain. But I very much think that we do not self-select out um, because you end up with folks building cool stuff in RWAs, in SocialFi, in gaming, um, in NFTFi, everything in between. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, Timeline-wise, and I know you you may not want to commit to this <laughs> rough timeline and yeah, uh, yeah. your engineers to kill you either. Of course, of course. Taking a, but, you know, you've had mainnet, you've had some success there, a lot of interest. Um, when, when mainnet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, Tesla has been good to us. Um, I think they were looking at mainnet, you know, sometime in Q2, Q3. So it's really not that far out now. Um, you know, of course, there's always a little bit of like logistical stuff that we'll need to handle. So, you know, finishing locking down our market maker selections and all that kind of stuff and talking with some of our, our lovely friends at big exchanges and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think for, for the last little while, we just wanted to make sure that product and scalability was in the best place possible before, you know, hitting the road. I think, I think the last thing that we want to do is ship something that we aren't proud of um, or ship something that we don't think will you know, very easily stand the test of time. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty excited about a lot of the, the recent progress that's been made because I do think that that very much leaves us in a state where we can think to ourselves like, yeah, like this thing's going to run for 10, 20, whatever years and it'll it'll sustain in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I think it begins and ends, as you said, with you have to believe that and have conviction that there is a very thriving applications be, being built that support the fee the fee mechanism, like, because that drives everything. Uh, and it. it's so obvious, but somehow we it, it can get lost when um, with other things. But it's always been clear for. for um, I'm curious. Um, I always like to kind of end these discussions um, with, you know, as someone that, you know, you built Bear through the Bear, um, <laughs> you've been involved in crypto for a long time. Um, what has surprised you the most? And I think it's interesting to con- c- like set the stage because you, you built it not only at the time where like there's just so many L2s, there's so many competing, you know, EVM, like Ethereum killers. Yeah, and yeah. here you are building something new <laughs> through a bear market. And I'm curious, like what has surprised you the most in this journey? Yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, I think the... I think the biggest thing that has surprised me, probably one, probably two things. Um, one is that is it's very easy. I think when you're when you're starting out, um, you know, building in a new space that isn't super super familiar from like a builder point of view, right? Um, it's it's easy to think like, okay, there's some preordained playbook. Um, there is a set of rules that I have to follow that leads to a win condition. 
right? Like I check this box, I check this box and I'm good. Um, and I think that that's, that's what we believed for some portion of time. It's like, okay, cool. Like, you know, AVAX did this or Harmony did this or Mir did this or, you know, Arbitrum did this, that, therefore this is what we have to do. Um, and then I think that like, as you, you meet your heroes or as you talk to on, on a relatively like, you know, uh, on a relatively raw level with a lot of these folks, um, it's the same thing that I think anyone learns, like, you know, as they, they grow up or as you build your first company, et cetera. And like for context, Papa and I had both built companies in, in the other side of the spectrum in like healthcare before this. Um, so we definitely weren't unfamiliar with the feeling, but we thought that there was a much more established playbook, I want to say, in crypto. And I, I think quickly realized that, um, you know, it's much less deterministic and rather it's actually one of the interesting fields where leaning into the degree of, of insanity or the lack of seriousness can be a, a massive source of edge if done correctly. So I think that, you know, that was massively surprising. Um, and I think that the other thing that was somewhat surprising um, was just how mercenary and how low the bar can be at times, right? Like, I think that I've rarely, I, I think that when you when you have a new industry in a relatively nascent space like crypto, you do, you do two things. You attract the best of people and you attract the worst of people, totally. right? Like you, you get the folks who are like, hey, I want to come and fix this and make it better. And you get the folks who are like, yo, this thing's fucked. Let me extract as much value as possible and then get out, right? So I've met, you know, some of my favorite people working in the space, but I've also met some people who have, you know, just inexcusable shit to your behavior oh, um, yeah. that in Web 2 would just get you like burned for life. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm sure you've seen this too, having been in the, it for a while and having, uh, you know, shared a somewhat similar background of healthcare, yeah. crypto, et cetera, right? So I think that... Uh, that was that was a little bit of like a, a black pill for me. Yeah. And sorry, I think like one last thing, um, and this is probably like the, the taboo point, is I really truly believe, and, and I don't necessarily ascribe to this camp as a caveat, but I really truly believe that the vast majority of the participants do not care about the tech right now, no. um, for better or for worse, right? I agree. Um, I, and I, I think that that like is also shocking um, in a manner coming from a field that is very like, empirically driven very like rigor based very like you know you spend 10 years in a lab to spin out something to try to get into some mice or something right and then you're like wait like no one cares about what's happening tech wise right now all they care about is what people think is happening tech wise right now um and that's a, that's a tough pill to swallow um especially if you're somewhat idealist right so i, I think that we've very much tried to do our best to um, you know, responsibly play the game in terms of narratives, building, et cetera, um, while building tech that we think can really have massive edge. Um, but it's really interesting to think about how it's all narratives and barbells all the way down. Yeah. I I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, I think if I were a builder, and when I talked about this, it's, I think you just assume that it's going to be mercenary. Like the beauty of crypto, which is also a bit of a curse, is that <clears throat> It assumes that everyone will act in their best interest. Totally. And I think when oftentimes people lean on the more idealistic side, and that's where I think problems start to emerge. Yeah. And I'll, so I think you just assume that the worst, because if you yeah. if, if the system works under that type of stress, then you really are setting yourself up for success. You've got um, it. And I think that should be kind of the operating assumption. But you're right. I mean, it can be hard. <laughs> no, and like, look, not to be, uh, not to be. Like, Discord and people are bitching at you and screaming <laughs> at you. And of course. I guess the best way I've heard it's not recently. Uh, we're talking about, and someone said it, look, at least they care. Whether it's <laughs> they're screaming. So they're really passionate. So you're yeah. doing something right. It's like, okay. Well, you yeah. know, it, it brings a couple things to mind that we say a lot internally, right? Um, the opposite of like, of love isn't necessarily hate. It, it's apathy, right? It's, yeah. it's just not caring. Right. 100%. And then the other thing that's been really interesting to see, especially building anonymously, which I think has been a, a massive edge for us in some ways, even though it might be perceived as otherwise in others, um, has been the, like, you know, something that the Papa said to me once and kind of stuck with me. Uh, and we, we say it a lot internally again now too, is that, you know, we tend to judge ourselves by our intentions uh, and others by their actions. Right. Um, and I think that the interesting thing about the crypto space with as many anon characters, as many people who's, who are just abstracted in some manner, is that there is perhaps the, the greatest like playground for judging people based on their actions and what they do, and not just what they say they're going to do. 
And I think that's one of the things that I've appreciated a lot about the space. Every now and then, like, you know, sucks and people just do bad things. But every now and then you can just, you know, be the, be incredibly pleasantly surprised by OX water bottle kind of thing. Hey, man. I mean, don't send me a resume. Don't tell me what you think. Show me your on-chain activity. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know? Show me your wallet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's been a real treat. Um, I think this discussion, even as an investor, has been a great catch up because uh, I've appreciated so much what you guys are building and excited to see the kind of applications uh, that are being built. Um, and I think it, it does lend itself to very, I'm really more excited about the kind of zero to one, the new primitives and yeah. how this really tight alignment of security and liquidity, which has been a challenge historically for every other chain. Um, shapes up with you guys. So um, yeah, it's uh, it's very exciting. So thanks for coming on, Smokey. Real real treat. Uh, we've been wanting to do this for a while and I'm glad we got it done. Uh, I, think it's at the, I think it's at the really pivotal time you guys are, are at and uh, coming out of Bear Palooza, coming out of, you know, it, it, Testnet. Um, any parting thoughts? I guess where can people f- find more about the ecosystem if they're interested in? Are you hiring uh, or yeah, yeah. as a builder uh, or just general parting thoughts? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks, man. Um, a, appreciate the kind words. It's been a pleasure. Um, B, you know, when we think about next things for us, um, we're going to be expanding pretty aggressively geographically. Um, you know, on the tails of a race. Um, so we already have a few different outposts, as I mentioned. Um, but we're probably going to be doubling down and spending more time in um, in Asia, uh, and then after about too long, Latin America and then Africa. Um, so we're thinking a lot about Southeast Asia, so Vietnam, Thailand, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, um, you know, outside of SEA, also Japan. I'm looking for more folks who can help over there because I think there's a, a massive tide turning. Um, funnily enough, you know, this, this is like this is perhaps a shocker for some folks, but Beartain does not have like a, a formal marketing team at the moment. Like we got one guy who helps with like events and a little bit of guerrilla marketing. Um, but a lot of it is just sort of uh, organic autism. Uh, and, that is and... shocking. That, that is <laughs> probably the most shocking thing I've heard in this pod. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, because I think the, the thing is like, I, I, I haven't found someone um, yet where I'm like, yes, I believe that this person is the right degree of native and capable of execution um, to, to hand over like some of the reins for how we try to execute things. Um, so that's also a position that we'd love to see someone take up over time, um, actively fielding candidates right now for, you know, folks across Asia, um, and sort of like a, a head of marketing CMO type of role. Um, and then beyond that, you know, for, for anyone who wants to find me, I'm normally pretty accessible on Twitter. Um, DMs are a little bit of a mess more recently, but, but working through them, I try to have one night where I just zone out every week and just respond to like hundreds of messages. Um, so, you know, Smokey the Bear on Twitter. And beyond that, um, I'd recommend just reaching out. If you tag someone from the Bear Chain community on Twitter, um, there's a pretty decent chance that, that it'll find its way to me or my teammates' desks really quickly. Um, and we'll find our ways to, to help you in whatever way we can. And um, I think the last thing I'd say is that, you know, if you're a builder, if you're figuring out where you want to go next, and if you're, if you're looking for a new home, for example, and you're building something that you think is cool, new, and interesting, um, you know, please do hit us up. We believe that we are firmly in a, in a services industry as, as people, you know, stewarding a foundation or helping to build a chain. Um, it's our job to make your lives easier and our job to do everything we can to help you guys win on their chain. Um, because if you guys win, so do we, right? So um, if you're building something cool, hit us up, um, Twitter DMs, you know, email, whatever it might be. And uh, we're there to help. Is, this, is Build-A-Bear a meme? Yeah, build a bear is uh, is is real. It's um, build a bear. I see that percolate, so I love it. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's yeah dude. It, it's people can relate. And, it, and it's very much in like a same same fashion of like how do we set the bar high for the ecosystem, and also yeah. help de- you know demonstrate to some teams of experienced builders that we can help them end to end. Whether that's go to market and product strategy, whether that's narrative positioning, whether that's fundraising, um, and I think you guys will probably see much more come out of that in the next little while. All right. Awesome. Awesome, Smokey. Again, thank you so much, man. Uh, and I think we're going to have to catch up soon once you go away. <laughs> and we're going to have to have you on and, and maybe a couple of cool builders, maybe the Shogun guys, maybe some of the validators to get yeah. some an added dimension here into the discussion and, and especially proof of liquidity. I'm incredibly excited. And um, yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, of course, man. Thanks so much for having me. I'll catch you.
Hey everyone, Jason here. Thank you so much for watching today's episode. Wanted to take a quick second to thank today's title sponsor, Arbitrum. We know you are tired of on-chain experiences that have unaffordable fees and frustrating transaction speeds, and that's why we partnered with Arbitrum. You can experience frictionless trades, lightning speed, and lag-free transactions, all for pennies per transaction. Explore Arbitrum's expanding ecosystem at portal.arbitrum.io. That's portal.arbitrum.io. See you for the next episode.